glad you're here with us on this Easter Sunday. I'm going to read from Luke 24, verses 1 through 8. It says, very early on Sunday morning, the women went to the tomb carrying the spices that they had prepared. When they found the stone rolled away from the entrance, they went in. shining white clothes stood beside them. The women were afraid and they bowed to the ground. But the men said, why are you looking in the place of the dead for someone who is alive? Jesus isn't here. He has been raised from death. Remember that while he was still in Galilee, he told you the Son of Man will be handed over to sinners who will nail him to a cross. But three days later, he will rise again. Then they remembered what Jesus had said. Holy Spirit, we come and we thank you. God, we thank you that you chose to a human form so that it would be something we could understand. Thank you that you proved the miracle, the hardest thing to do was conquer death and bring that life. Jesus, we thank you for that. We praise you for that. We make space in our lives for you to be king. For you to be in control, God. We give it to you. Take joy today.
better than that. He is the King of Kings. He is Lord of Lords. Can you give my God, our God, all the glory, all the praise due his name? And could you lift up your hands and give it up for this wonderful worship team choir, the band. Give it up for the band. Praise God. Praise God for all he's doing. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Oh, you Got it. That's awesome. <laughs> Let us look to the Lord in prayer. Holy God, you are all-powerful, almighty, everlasting, Prince of Peace. You are everything to each and every one of us. God, and we pray that you would come and meet us right now in this space. Have your way in Jesus' name. Amen. Before you take your seat, would you shake the hand of the person next to you and say, Welcome to Mercy and Happy Easter. What a wonderful day it is to celebrate our Lord, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and his resurrection from the grave. We are so excited about this day and all that it holds for each and every one of us. Hey, if we have not met yet, my name is Gary Dawkins. I'm lead pastor here at Mercy Vineyard Church, and I'm so glad that you are here. Welcome, each and every one of you. Now, we want all of our services to be engaging and interactive, so we ask you to sing along with the music we have the songs on the screens, and we will have more music coming at the end of the service. And we want you to participate in the message. That's right. Talk back to me. I'm a black preacher, and I like not a quiet house now. Come on now. So, 
Talk back to me, okay? All right, good, good, good. We're going to get excited. Also, uh, we would love for you to participate in filling out one of these. This is our Connect card. It's just a tool we use to serve each and every one of you a little bit better. Uh, you can actually scan the QR code if you'd like to fill it out on your mobile device. But if you're here for the very first time or you've been here for 20 years, we want you to fill this card out and let us know how you doing, how you doing. You see, there are some smiley faces and sad faces right there on the card. That makes it easy for you to let us know how you're feeling right now. Go ahead and mark that off. But there's also space near the bottom for your confidential prayer requests. You see, if you have anything going on in your life that you would like prayer for, make sure you write it down on this card. We have a team that is gifted and uh, trained in prayer, and we trust their confidentiality. They would love to pray for you this week. When you're finished with the card or at the end of today's service, go ahead and take the card and drop it in the boxes at the back labeled Connect Card. Now, here's another way you can participate in service today. You can uh, participate and continue worshiping through giving. Now, here's some ways that you can give right there on the side screens or there's an envelope in the seat pocket in front of you or right behind you if you're sitting in the front row. Thank you so much for your generosity because it's only because of your love and generosity that we're able to do all the things that we do here at Mercy. So thank you for uh, investing in this side of the kingdom so that we can continue to impact lives for Jesus. Now, we have a special, special presentation for all of you who are kids or you feel like you're a kid. Would you come on up to the front? We have a great story time just for you. Kids, kids, right. those who feel like they're kids. All right. So kids, yeah, Pastor Gary's right. If you can come actually on, leave yeah. your seats, see you, mom see. and dads can come if they want, or they can just send them up. And yep. I would like you to come right up front here. All right? Come on, kids. Oh, we've got Mom and dad, you can right. come with them if, yep. you, if, if, you're, you, if you don't promise, feel comfortable. There you go. Bring them on up. Yep. Just for a few minutes. Kids, you can come on up and you can find a seat. So kids, while you're coming up, my name is Jesse. I'm one of the pastors here. And every, the months that have five Sundays, we like to do Big Church Sunday here at Mercy. And Easter just happens to fall on a Big Church Sunday, the fifth Sunday of every month. Because we believe that church is for everyone. And God works in our hearts, whether we're two or whether we're 102. And so we're so excited, kids, to have you in our Big Church Sunday service this day. Well, kids, what we're going to do is we're going to sit right here. We're going to listen to Miss Brianna talk about a story from the big God story, okay, about the Bible, about the day that Jesus came back to life. So you get to participate a little bit, and first service did such a good job of listening. So we're going to keep listening, and then we'll give you an activity on the way back, okay? All right, welcome. You know, sometimes at night my, when I tuck my kids in at bed, they ask for stories. And they call them either little mama or little papa stories. And I'll tell them stories about when I was a little girl. And often my children will say, and then, Mom, what's next? What happened next? Right? You know, we, we listened to a sad story on Friday when we heard about Jesus dying. And it sort of makes me want to ask that question, too. And then? Like, what's next? What's get, what happens next? But to tell this story, I'm going to need all of your help. This includes grown-ups, too. So when I make this gesture, I want you to pay attention as well. But kids, this is, I want you to really dial in on this. When I make this gesture like this, kind of shrugging my shoulders, I want you to respond with, and then? Okay, let's practice. <laughs> That's right. And you have to be paying really close attention, because all throughout the story, we're going to be making this question. <laughs> kind of like, what's happening next? What's going to take place next? So, like we heard on Good Friday, Jesus was arrested by some religious leaders, accused of many things. But Jesus didn't respond to any of these accusations. He knew that he had come to die for us. And that was all part of God's plan. And even though Jesus hadn't done anything wrong, the leaders made a plan, and it worked, and Jesus died. And that's where we sort of left off on Good Friday. <laughs> So after Jesus died, one of Jesus' followers took his body off the cross and he placed it in a tomb, which was like a cave. And someone took a large stone and rolled it over the entrance so that no one could get in or out. Or 
solely that. And as an extra measure, there were guards that were posted outside to make sure that no one came in or got out, or so they thought. Now, Jesus' friends were obviously sad. They thought they would never see Jesus again. How could this happen? Do you remember in all of our Bible stories at Kids Church, we've been talking about how Jesus is the rescuer? Do you remember that, kids? And we've been talking about how, remember the king, he came in on that donkey on Palm Sunday during the triumphal entry? So what happened to this rescuer, this king, like the people were promised? It wasn't supposed to end like this, was it? Well, just before sunrise, three days after Jesus died, there was an earthquake that came. Everything sort of trembled, and an angel from heaven appeared. When the guards saw the angel, they fell down with fright. Now watch this magic. <laughs> the angel rolled that huge stone away, and they waited. Now it was still dark out, Mary Magdalene and some other women headed to the tomb to put spices on the body. It was early in the morning, maybe the dew was glistening on the trees, and the birds were chirping. The friends walked quietly down this dusty path, telling each other stories about Jesus. They remembered times they had followed him around the countryside, times when he had taught the people. But when they got close, they noticed something very strange. The tomb was wide open. That stone had been rolled away. So the women went and they peered inside of the tomb. They went and looked inside. What could have happened? And guess what they saw? They saw nothing. Jesus' body was gone. And then something else really crazy. There was a person standing there with brilliant, shining white clothes. <laughs> Don't be scared, the angel said, but they couldn't help it. They screamed anyway. <laughs> the angel asked them, what are you doing here? This is a tomb, and tombs are for dead people. The women couldn't speak. What do you mean? Jesus isn't dead anymore, the angel said. He's alive again. And their hearts left for just a moment. They thought, could this be true? Maybe they'd finally woken up from that terrible nightmare. <laughs> well, two of the women decided to rush home and go tell everyone they knew about this good news. Jesus was alive. He wasn't dead anymore. Mary stayed back. How could it be true? Jesus had definitely been dead, right? Could he really be alive? We know from the story of Lazarus that we heard a few weeks ago that Jesus is more powerful than anything, even death. Remember hearing that story about Lazarus? But could Mary believe this too? Just then Mary heard someone in the garden. Perhaps it's just the garden, she thought. Maybe he'll know where Jesus' body is. Hello? Who's there? Do you know where, do you know where my friend Jesus is? Mary asked urgently. I can't find him. Now, Mary didn't know where Jesus was, but Jesus knew where she was. Mary? Only one person said her name like that. She could hear her own heart thumping, and she turned around, and she could make out a figure. Remember, it was still a little dark, so she kind of shaded her eyes and looked. Could it be true? She thought she was dreaming. But she wasn't dreaming, she was seeing. Jesus! She fell to the ground, and sudden tears filled her eyes, and great sobs shook her whole body. She wanted in that moment to cling to Jesus and never let him go. Jesus said, you'll be able to hold on to me later, but right now, go and tell the others that I'm alive. And that's exactly what Mary did. Mary ran and ran and ran all the way to the city. She couldn't wait to tell everyone that Jesus had made all the sad things untrue and that God was making even death untrue. 
Mary had the very best answer to the question we've been asking this whole story. The story of the resurrection shows that Jesus is more powerful than anything, even death. Jesus took the punishment for all of our sins and forgave us our sins, but he didn't stay dead. When we say, he is risen, we're celebrating the very best, and then, because Jesus is alive. Amen. Boys, thank you, Miss Brianna and Tora. Th Boys and girls, you were such good listeners. Thank you. So here's what's going to happen next. Not now, but when I say go, I'm going to have you stand up, and we're going to actually exit these two ways this time. And here's what we're going to do. Pastor Gary's going to come up, and he's going to continue to talk about the Easter story and what that means for us today. But I would like for each of you to grab one of these sheets. There's words that Pastor Gary is going to be saying while he is preaching that as you hear these words, guess what's clipped on the back? Jelly beans, right? We need more sugar, right, parents? And so what you can do is you can actually place the jelly beans on the road to Emmaus that Gary is going to be talking about. And I give you, you, you're, you have to ask your parents when you can eat the jelly beans. Okay? All right? Does that sound good? Okay. Can you boys and girls stand up and go grab one from Petora or Miss Mary over here? So kids, you can grab the sheets of paper over there and find your parents. He has not said any yet. Nope. Do you want this one, honey? Right, there you go. Go. Happy Easter, everyone, and welcome to Mercy in your church. Welcome to all of our guests this morning. There's a gift at the welcome desk for you in the lobby, so make sure you pick that up before leaving today. We like to get together here at Mercy, and we're excited to get together on April 12th from 6 to 8 p.m. for your local feast. Many of you can wear answers to dinner tables. Whether your family has recently immigrated, native to the land, or came over long ago, come enjoy food from different origins and share the story of your food. Are you looking to get baptized? Sign up for the baptism interest meeting on April 7th after Azure service. You can learn more about baptism and see if it's something you really want to do. That same day on April 7th, join us after the 1030 service for a prayer training. Learn the Vineyard five-step prayer model and practice praying for others. Now I'm turning it over to Pastor Gary as he continues the message series called Rock of Happy Easter, everyone! <laughs> Praise God for Rakea and Elena. Praise God for Rakea and Elena. Great job on the announcements. Happy Easter to each and every one of you. Happy Resurrection Sunday to everyone here today. And to all of you watching online, thank you for joining us. And uh, we, we pray that God will bless you wherever you are in the world today. Uh, today I'm going to be reading from the book of Luke chapter number 24. So if you have your Bibles, would you open them up or turn them on and follow along with me? I'll be reading from the New International Version of the Scriptures, um, Luke chapter number 24, verses 13 through 34. An extensive passage, but I believe context is important. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things? he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. 
And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came, to, uh, they came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. He said to them, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. Jump down to verse 33. They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, It is is true the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon we're going to continue today's uh, sermon series walking with Jesus by preaching walking with Jesus on the wrong road Holy Spirit would you come have your way would you preach this sermon would you fill me would you pour out to your congregation God and would you inspire someone today? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Kids in the house, y'all just had a great lesson. But here's a question for you. I don't know if you know. Do you know what a GPS is? Yeah? No? No? Yeah. Well, a kid, a kid. Who knows what a GPS is? Put your hand up in the air. Tell me, tell me, tell me. What, what's the GPS? Shout it out. Kids, not it's a computer. What kind of computer? Good job. What does it do? A map. A map. Like Dora the Explorer? Yes. Okay. Great. This is awesome. I love it. Talk back to me like I asked you. <laughs> Adults, what did we do before GPS? <laughs> listen, listen, listen. Maybe there is a... A strong spirit in the house. I believe that some of y'all know what this is. I remember my dad pulling these out, covering the whole front seat to figure out where we going. I'm like, don't you want to stop the car first? <laughs> I feel, feel it in the air. I feel a strong spirit in the air. That there's a map quest generation in the house. <laughs> map questers, hey, hey, listen. All you young people in here, let me tell you what your parents used to do. We used to print out the directions and hold them up and try to read them while we're driving. Yeah, map quest. Cause of many accidents across the nation. <laughs> but I'm so glad. And so grateful to my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, for GPS, for Apple Maps, for Google Maps, and my favorite, Waze. Any, any Waze users? Wait, all right, all right, we got like, what, 10? Oh, my goodness. Y'all don't know about Waze? Waze is where it's at. Waze, Waze, Waze is a social media traffic app. Meaning that you can post and report things that you encounter on the road. Oh, it's so wonderful because, it, because of that, you get to see where the traffic is. You get to see where the holdup is. You get to see where the, the, the pothole is in the street. You get to see where the roadkill is. Oh, my gosh. You get to see, right, what's slowing down traffic. And my favorite part, you get to see where the police are camping out. <laughs> Slow down, Gary. Slow down. <laughs> Praise God for his safety. Amen. <laughs> GPS has saved the day many times in my life. Slow down at the right time. Avoid traffic. It reroutes me, puts me on the right track. You see, even when I take the wrong road or go the wrong direction, it will recalculate the route for me 
without condemnation. I love that, right? I put the Snoop Dogg voice on there. And Snoop Dogg doesn't cuss me out, doesn't fuss at me. He's Gary, you idiot. You're not supposed to take that turn. No. It just reroutes. Turn left up here, player. Right? <laughs> the GPS helps me out because it will recalculate. It, it, it never gives up on me. Even when I am distracted by Chick-fil-A or Starbucks, right? And thank God there's no such thing as a Krispy Kreme around here. I uh, say, so y'all don't know. I, I don't know. Have you ever seen a Krispy Kreme when the light, it lights up, they're hot and ready? It'll make you cause an accident. You turn it over trying to get one of them fresh donuts? Oh, if you don't know what Krispy Kreme is, you need to travel miles and find one. It will change your life and your health. <laughs> Even if I intentionally go in the wrong direction, my GPS will redirect me. It will guide me because it knows my destiny. Such is the story that we see in today's scripture of Luke chapter 24. This is the first Easter Sunday, the first day where Jesus rises from the grave. His resurrection is made real. As the kid's story said, he made death even a lie. And he meets two men on a road. They are actually followers of Jesus. They're actually disciples. And they're walking away from Jerusalem. These two men are walking away from the feast of the Passover. These two men are walking away from the miracle. These two men are walking away from the location of the resurrection. These two men are walking away from the place that will be the start and the birth of the church. These two men are walking away from the place where God will pour his Holy Spirit out upon his followers. This, they are walking away from the place where the women said, Jesus Christ is alive. They're walking away. They are headed back to their hometown, this place called Emmaus. That's one of your words on your paper, jelly bean time. <laughs> They're going to Emmaus. Watch this. Why are they going back to Emmaus? Because they got some bad news. Heartbreaking news, life transforming news. The, the person that they were following, the person that they thought was going to redeem Israel, the person that they thought was the Messiah, was now crucified on a Calvary's cross. Nobody has ever come back from a crucifixion. The Romans were too good. They spent centuries perfecting this execution style. Have you ever received bad news? Have you ever received a phone call that was life-altering, that, that, that just turned your spirit off, that you just created, it created sadness and depression in your soul? Have you ever had bad news? Or have you ever had something that happened in your life that just, just took you down, took you away from who you were? People looking at you and like, Gary, you're not yourself. What's going on in your life? Have you ever experienced a bad day? Maybe your first instinct when you experienced something like that was to run away, to get as far away from that thing as possible. Maybe your instinct was to go back to a familiar place, to go back home like these guys. I'm going back home. I'm going back to Emmaus because at least I know what to expect there. Maybe your instinct was to go back to that addiction or to go back to that habit or go back to that person's house where you know you don't belong. You see, sometimes our emotions will make us make bad decisions. But whatever news that you've encountered, whatever is depressing you or, or bringing you down, I want you to know this, that Jesus is bigger than that. 
Jesus is bigger than what you are facing. Back to these two men, they are walking together, they're talking together, talking about the events of the weekend, and a stranger shows up. So I'm walking along with them. Has a conversation, that's one of your words, a conversation with these two guys walking on this road to Emmaus. Hmm. And he asked them a question. What are y'all talking about? It's Gary Dawkins' translation. Oops. <laughs> he said, what, what, what are y'all talking about? And, and, and have you ever been asked a question by someone that, that the, you know, the answer was so obvious it made you look at them sideways? What's wrong? What's going on? What, what kind of question is that, man? Don't, don't you know what's going on? Don't, haven't you ex uh, heard about all the drama that's going down in Jerusalem? Don't you know all the problems that are happening right now? Haven't you heard? Or have you just transported yourself in from the multiverse? <laughs> You're not aware. You're not aware. No Marvel fans in here? Okay. <laughs> Jesus asks questions not to get answers. <laughs> Jesus is omniscient. Jesus is all-knowing. He, he knows all the answers to all the questions. He never asks a question or asks you a question to get an answer. He asks a question to get to a point. He's trying to prove a point in your life. Anytime you hear a question from God, it's not because he needs an answer. When God told Adam, where are you? He wasn't looking for Adam to say right here. He knows where he is. He wants him to realize where he is. Where are you right now? Jesus asks a question because he notices something, and he wants to put them on notice that he notices it. First thing that he notices and observes is that uh, he uh, notices their disposition. You see, they are sad. The text says that they are downcast. You see, there's nothing wrong with being sad. We should all feel our feelings. We, we, honestly, we have too much of that going on where we, we are trying to stuff our feelings, trying not to feel or experience our feelings. Listen, you have been given a full range of emotions to feel them, so feel them. Sometimes you need to sit down and take a time out and feel your feelings. Don't try to get over it so fast because you got to get to work and you got to do it. Take a day off and cry sometimes. Sit in silence sometimes and feel what the Holy Spirit is trying to place upon you. What's he trying to get you to see? What's he trying to pull out of you? He notices their disposition. But we have to be careful because sometimes we allow our emotions to get the best of us. Sometimes we allow our emotions to make decisions for us. And our emotions can easily send us down the wrong road. Yeah. You see, when your emotions run high, your logic usually runs pretty low. And you make irrational decisions. One research that I was reading showed that you are likely, more likely to set your goals lower when you're feeling sad. Did you know that? You create low expe expectations for yourself in order to have a more achievable goal. So you try to feel good about yourself, so you set your expectations low. And all that does is it prevents you from reaching your greatest potential. You see, God has a greater plan for you. He has a, a greater idea for your life than probably what you can see right now. But often we, uh, we set our goals too low. And God has our goals set for success, set for exceedingly and abundantly above whatever we can ask or think. So strive for greatness. Strive for the top. Always go for the best because God wants the best for you. He created you for the best. 
Let no emotion, let no circumstance, let no situation, let no hater or enemy uh, 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 hold you back from being all that God has created you to be. If you are here today and you are down, if you are here today and you are downcast, feeling sad, feeling down, remember that we serve a Savior who specializes in getting back up. We serve a Savior who, who, who didn't stay down, but he got back up. We serve a Savior who don't, won't let you stay down, but he will always reach down and pull you back up. These two followers are walking together in disappointment. Did you know misery loves company? Yeah, misery loves company. But you don't have to be either one of them. You don't have to be the misery, nor do you have to be the company. Get out of there. Get out of there. <laughs> misery loves company. Yeah, yeah. Meaning this, don't let anyone steal your joy. Don't let anyone come into your life and steal your peace. And watch this, the most important person you need to be blocking from stealing your joy and stealing your peace is you. Sometimes you need to look in the mirror and encourage yourself. Sometimes you need to look in the mirror and talk to yourself like, you ain't going to take yourself down today. We're going to do everything in our power to be all that God has called us to be. You got to pump yourself up sometime. Don't wait on everybody else. Let me say this real quick. And uh, sometimes we need to uh, break up with those who are dragging us down. Ooh-wee. <laughs> sometimes we need to realize that we need to take a step back from that negative crowd. Take a step back from that crowd that's going down the wrong road. Take a step back from those people who keep on putting us down and we can't seem to breathe or get our head above water. Sometimes we need to take a step back. Be careful who you allow to speak into your life. Be careful of who you allow in your circle. Be careful of who you follow on social media. Be careful of the, who influences you. Because negative people can harden your heart. And watch this, they can desensitize you to the presence of Jesus. You see what happened in the text? Verse number 16 said that they couldn't even see Jesus and he's right there next to them. Because there's two people dragging each other down and all they're doing is, woe is me. And they can't see the miracle right next to them. Sometimes the people that we connect with are dragging us so far down and Jesus is doing the miraculous right next to us and we just can't see it. You got to get away from some of those folks sometimes. Take a break. All right, let me get back on track. He saw two things. Jesus saw two things. The second thing that he saw was their direction. He saw their disposition and their direction. You see, he meets them on this road to Emmaus. That road is leading away from all the good stuff. It's leading away from the resurrection. It's leading away from the miracle. And they are headed down the wrong road. Maybe you have been walking with Jesus for some years now. Maybe you've been walking with Jesus just for a few months. Maybe you've been coming to church just, just off and on or even regular. Maybe you've been volunteering in ministry. You've been helping the homeless. You've been, you've been engaging in activity, but you still feel distant. You still feel like, I, I, I don't feel the power of the Holy Spirit like I used to. I, I don't feel God moving in my life. I, I would like to ask you to check your direction. Check your direction. Because watch this. The question is, what direction are you going? Are you going in your own direction attempting to drag Jesus along with you or are you going in Jesus's direction following him toward your destiny you see he's got something greater planned for you but when you're trying to do it all yourself then you're you're setting the bar low 
He's got something greater for you. Follow him and watch what he has in store. Check your direction. But the beautiful thing about this whole text, and if you missed this, you missed the whole, ser- the whole thing. So, so watch that. The beautiful thing about Jesus is that he will find you on the wrong road. No matter what road you're on, no matter how far you're walking away from, no matter if you're intentionally walking away from him, he will come alongside and find where you are. Just like your GPS. But let me, let me tell you this, you see, because a lot of us have some bad theology. See, some of us talk about, well, back in 1972, I, I, I found Jesus. I found Jesus uh, when I was in the club. I found Jesus when I was doing this. I found Jesus when I was doing that. You can't find Jesus because he's not lost. You're the one who lost. I'm the one who's lost. He's got to come along and find me. Let's get rid of that bad theology. God is trying to find you because he loves you too much. He never wants you to drift away. He never wants you to go too far from him. He, but he will always be there with you. So with that in mind, all of us have some wrong roads that we've gone down in our lives. All of us have some wrong roads that we're on right now. All of us have something in our lives that we could actually get back on track with and follow Jesus a little bit closer. All of us have some area in our lives that we're not allowing the light of Jesus to shine as bright as it could in that area. When you find that area of your life that you are traveling down the wrong road, I believe that Jesus has three things he wants to teach us from this text that we can apply to our lives right now. Number one. He wants us to learn to request his presence. Request his presence. You see, even though he's coming to find you, he will never impose himself upon you. He's too much of a gentleman for that. He's going to wait for your invitation to invite him into your life. I'll prove it to you. I'm not just making it up. Look at verse number 29. It says, but they urged him strongly, stay with us. They, they, the, the Greek for that, that phrase, they urged him strongly, means to compel by em, uh, employing force. To compel by employing force. Meaning they grabbing all on his shirt, his clothes. They grabbing his arm like, Jesus, we need you to stay right here. I wonder if there's anybody in here who has a passion enough for Jesus that you're willing to cry out to him. You're willing to reach out to him. You're willing to do anything possible to grab a hold of him and say, Jesus, I need you in my life in this area right now. God, I can't make it without you. Request his presence. But not only do we need to request his presence, but if we're on the wrong road, we need to respect his word. Respect his word. Uh, 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 Jonathan Stewart said this, and I quote him from Good Friday, this past, this past Good Friday. He said, to take Jesus seriously, we need to take the scriptures seriously. You and I need to get back to taking the Bible seriously. Watch this. Verse number 27 says, and beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in how many of the scriptures? All of the scriptures concerning himself. Jesus, watch this, he is the master theologian. He, he knows the whole text because he wrote it. But watch this, to, the, the word explain there in the Greek means to unfold. So we unfold something so we can see it better. Unfold that map. I got to figure out how to fold it back up now. <laughs> to unfold, to make things clear, right? He conducted a hermeneutic or accurate biblical interpretation so that they can see him in the text. Did you know the whole Bible was about Jesus? Come on, Gary. 
Jesus doesn't show up until the back of the book. I read it. Matthew chapter number two, Jesus was born. Christmas time. I got you right there. Jesus went back and did a Bible study with these two guys, and he went from Genesis to Malachi and said, this is all about me. I don't know if you read the Bible, but right in the first four words, Jesus is right there. It says, in the beginning, God. That word God in the Hebrew is the word Elohim, which is the plural for God. Therefore, it is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. They are in there speaking the worlds into existence. Then it goes on a few more verses down, verse number 26. It says, and let us make man in our image. Who is that? Who is the us? It is God that knows not what it means to be alone, to be isolated. He's always been in community. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit came together as a council and said, let us make mankind after our image. That's just the beginning. That's the first page. Jesus shows up twice. Then we should go into some other stories. You see, the story of Abraham. Abraham was willing to sacrifice his own son for the glory of God, and then God provided a substitute to take the place of that boy. Sacrifice, right? Sacrifice. It sounds a whole lot like Jesus to me. Then we see the, uh, the, there's a story of Noah and Noah's ark. Noah's ark was a place of salvation and safety for whoever would come along and believe. That sounds a lot like Jesus to me. Then we have Rahab who risked her life to provide a, a, a security and safety and protection for a group of outsiders, people who are not a part of her tribe. That sounds a whole lot like Jesus to me. Then we got the story of Joseph. Joseph went through a whole lot of pain, a whole lot of punishment that he did not deserve. But God put him in a place to save his own people. That sound like a whole lot like Jesus Christ to me. This whole book from Genesis to Revelation is all about my king, Jesus the Christ. When we learn to take the scriptures seriously, when we learn to actually read the scriptures and find Jesus in every verse, watch this, he will, the next verse says, build a passion that burns on the inside of you. You want that passion back? You want that joy back? You want that love, that relationship you had with God when you first sparked this relationship? He says, get in my word. Start reading the scriptures and taking them seriously and watch that fire burn on the inside of you once again. This is the last lesson that Jesus wants us to be aware of, and that is to recognize his hand. Not only do we need to request his presence, not only do we need to respect his word, but we need to recognize his hands. Verse number 30 says this. When he was at the table with them, ha, he took bread, he gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him. Mm. And he disappeared from their sight. He took bread, he blessed it, and he broke it, and he gave it to them. He took bread, he blessed it, he broke it. And he gave it to him. What did that sound like? Sound like communion. But there's no wine present. Therefore, this is not communion. This is something else. And we learned about it two weeks ago at the Christ and the Passover service that we had here uh, uh, two Wednesdays ago. If you missed it, check it out. It's on the website. You can watch it on there. It was incredibly edifying. You should check it out. Because this represents a Jewish tradition where only the head or the master of the house has the authority to break bread, to bless it, and to pass it along to the family. Now, Jesus is not the master of the house because he's a guest invited into the house. The only way that he becomes the head or the master of the house is if you invite him in and give over the master title to him. 
in your life, ladies and gentlemen, my question to you is, have you made him the master of your life? Is he in charge of your life? Is he the actual king of kings and the Lord of lords in your heart? Watch this, because if he is, you got to let him break up some bread in your life. You got to let him move some things around in your life. You got to let him adjust some things in your life to get you to your destiny. But that'll never happen if you telling him what to do. If you dragging him along and Jesus bless my program, Jesus bless my theology, please Jesus bless everything that I want. Give me, give me, give me. No, Jesus, I want to be in step with you. So he took the bread, he broke it, he blessed it, and he gave it to him. Oh, y'all ain't got excited about that. He took the bread, he blessed it, he broke it, he gave it to him. Maybe you hear it this way. He took the bread. <laughs> he blessed it. He broke it. And he handed it to them. Ooh. Come on, Scott Whitmore. <laughs> if he's handing them the bread, they're going to see his hands. And his hands got some nail prints. And he's alive. And those nail prints ain't never been seen in a living person before. Because nobody's ever come down from that cross and walked to talk about it. Jesus Christ has the evidence of resurrection in his hands. And he's showing them the evidence by working it out right there in their own home. Jesus Christ is hands are moving in their life. His hands are moving in their household. And you know why? I know that Jesus Christ is alive today because I've seen his hands moving in my life. I've seen his hands moving in my household. I've seen his hands moving in my health. I've seen his hands moving on my job. I've seen his hands at work in my life. I wonder if there's anybody in here who's ever experienced the hand of Jesus moving in your life. Has anybody in here ever experienced the hand of Jesus guiding you, leading you, protecting you, blessing you, giving you, making a way out of no way? That's the Jesus we serve. He is just like a GPS. Every time you make a wrong move, he's going to show up and give you the right direction. Every time that we are in the wrong place, every time that we are, 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 are with the wrong crowd, every time we are ready to give up, every time we are distracted or disappointed, he recalculates our route to get us back on track to our destiny. And that, my friends, is a cause for celebration. So I'm going to call the worship team to come back up here. We're going to celebrate together. Listen, some of y'all might be looking for Jesus in the grave. Some of y'all might be worshiping a Jesus that's still hanging on a cross. Some of y'all might still have that cross, a crucifix Jesus hanging in your house. Jesus is no longer on a cross. Jesus is no longer bleeding. Jesus is no longer in a grave because the Jesus I serve specializes in resurrections. He got back up, y'all. He got back up. And not just for himself, he will lift you back up no matter how far you've fallen, no matter what road you're on, he's going to come and get you and he will lift you up. Would you stand up with us this morning? Listen, we're going to worship and praise God and then we will close out the service so Amy do your thing and everybody else too thank you
is King of Kings, he's Lord of Lords, and he's worthy of all of our praise. Let us go out today celebrating our King is risen. He is no longer in the grave, but he is alive. He's alive and well, and he lives inside of you and me. We'll have prayer teams up here to pray with you about anything that you have going on in your life. May the Lord God bless you. May he keep you. May heaven smile upon you, and may he bless you with an amazing week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Happy Easter. Happy Resurrection Sunday.